Good afternoon, colleagues. Let's start. We agreed uh, with the uh, Ministry of Education and Re Research to talk about uh, such a technical area as uh, the as managing uh, R&D development of Russia. We do have a set of goals. We do have a list of priorities. We also have some documents. It needs to fly somehow. I'll first introduce our panelists. To my left, Alexander Auzan, Dean of uh, the Economics Faculty of Moscow State Lomonosov University. Stanislav Kuznetsov, uh, Deputy uh, Chairman of the Board uh, of Sberbank. Alexander Sergeyev, uh, President of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Alexey Lihachev, uh, CEO of uh, Rosatom Agency. Mr. Kotikov, a co organizer of the round table. Mikhail Kovalchuk, president of the Kurchatov Institute. Anatoly Chubais, CEO of Rosnano. And Sergei Garkov, deputy economic development minister. There are other two people that we are not able to fit onto the stage. But again, it's uh, Vladimir Vasilyev, uh, who is a rector of Saint, the St. Petersburg uh, University of IT, Mechanics and Optics, and uh, Sergei Polakov, uh, CEO of uh, the Innovation Promotion foundation. So, can we briefly uh, you know, describe the framework of today's discussion, Mr. Kotikov? Thank you so much, uh, friends, colleagues. I'll try to be brief so we have more time for uh, substantive uh, debates later on. So, just some general observations. What we need to bear in mind is that the guiding principles are set forth in the development plan and the strategy for R&D development of Russia until 2025. We need to be ready to respond to the biggest challenges out there. It's a strategy for R&D, research, and scientific development going forward. Russia's development in R&D needs to become the key driving force for Russia's development to make Russia capable to responding to major challenges. And again, there is also a definition of uh, what are the institutions that are responsible for it. It also says that uh, government agencies and uh, ministries need to be consistent in pursuing this policy and this strategy. So it's a shared goal, and we need to work out the tool kits that would allow us to move our R&D forward, to create new sectors of the economy based on our own research. And it needs to be done together with uh, education establishments so that we can nurture new talents for the economy of today and the economy of the future. It's an extremely ambitious goal. I don't want to set any targets. 
I'm sure the audience is aware of the figures that we're looking at. We need to foster the development of infrastructure, our talents, and we need to bring about a marriage of all of these ingredients. We need to put it all together so that we provide a comprehensive solution, starting from research to uh, prototyping to rolling out the technology and production of new products that would allow us to increase the living standards of our people. So I believe this will be the core of our debate today. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kovalchuk, let's start, sir, with you. Big challenges, as we always say, and the changes that are taking place, the disruptions that we are seeing. Where are we heading? Is it possible to maintain the system of uh, R&D management in the way it currently is? or perhaps we might miss the new opportunities that will be out there, or we will be vulnerable and, or exposed to what is what are known as black swans. A few general observations, if you allow me. When we start doing something new, we need to look around and see where we are. So, you know, just like a horse uh, with, uh, with it is uh, blind, uh, uh, blind-faced, we're moving around and don't know where we are. Actually, science and research are the key driving force. The share of intellect, the share of R&D in the old years was three to four, three to five years. Now that we have the semiconductor era, we have about 30%. And now the share of R&D is up to 90 percent, 9-0. It means that the end result of science is actually the brainchild of the intellect. Number two, we need to pick the right priorities. And the document that the minister just referred to provides the framework of our priorities for the civilization. You might have strategic and tactic, tactical uh, priorities. So we have uh, the atomic project. Had we not had it, in August, when the U.S. dropped its uh, nuclear bombs on Japan, the Soviet Union perhaps could have faced a perilous situation had we not developed uh, our own nuclear bombs. So going back to our times, tactical priorities, they are market-driven, they are business-driven, they always depend on what's happening today. But strategic priorities, that's something that will shape our future. Science in itself is not homogeneous. It consists of a variety of different, by nature, by type of financing, of different elements. Here's an example. Our R&D model is based on German model. It was, the, it was Germany that set up the first uh, Academy of Sciences. It was done very simple. You have the uh, Max Planck uh, uh, Foundation. These are in fundamental science institutions. You have Helmholtz uh, Society. So you have fundamental science, and it actually accounts for a fraction of uh, the entire research. It's not. You know, it's, it doesn't make sense for the business of today, but without it, you won't have any future. It doesn't, uh, it's not sponsored very much. They produce publications, they uh, take part to the conferences, they live their own life. 
And then, this is level one, but you also have level two. These are applied institutions. They only get 30 to 50 percent of funding. The rest is given by the companies. So how much money from the market you can attract? That's a very important criteria. And number, level number three, that's Helmholtz Society, where they deal with global areas like cancer research, space, medicine things that define technological independence and national security. And there's also the humanitarian part to it. So we first need to look at our science, inventorize it and structurize, structuralize it. So the reform of R&D has been almost completed. We now have our own ministry and all of the institutions uh, and academies are part of one major ministry. So we first need to do an inventory of what we have. Without that, we would be running with our hands tied and with our eyes blindfolded. Now, number two, we need new approach. Everyone talks about digitalization, but what we forget about is when we do digitalization on non-existent hardware, that's just a, a, uh, an accelerated way to become a colony. This is, we, this is why we need to develop our own proprietary hardware. Now, another area is energy security, almost a third of uh, the energy that uh, is produced today is spent on Wi-Fi and internet networks. So we need to have independent energy systems. And number three, very often they say digitalization is and the new industrialization. It's both yes and no. Industrialization created assets, plants, property, and buildings, but digitalization doesn't do that. That's why it's different from industrialization. But there's another area where they coincide. Remember, there was a steam machine, and you had uh, the uh, disgruntled workers that started destroying them. So the yellow vests in France are the those uh, disgruntled workers. Uh, so they used, should be a plant uh, that produces cars, but you can introduce automation and you will then uh, get rid of all the people, there will be robots instead of people. In the, in the early 19th or 20th century, two-thirds of the people worked in the agriculture. Right now, these are two-thirds are in the industry. So what we're seeing today is take the U.S. The U.S. made a sort of a de-industrialization area, and now Trump promised to bring jobs back home, but this will never happen because the new industrialization will lead to the jobs being lost. And this is why the humanitarian part is very important. Either you develop child-free family and LGBT that will destroy population, or you resolve humanitarian issues. So I think we could discuss it further on, but that's it from me for now. So this is the, the framework of the debate that we will have today. Mr. Lihachov, now, based on what we already discussed and based on the experience that you have in transforming our R&D and science, do you think that the scientific community, the Russian scientific community, is it ready to become the major production force? Or 
Are we ready to lead something that technology interpreters would then build on? And what could be the role of the academia? Thank you, Mr. Pavalka. I will uh, follow up on what uh, Mr. Garkov uh, said uh, and on what Mr. Kavalchuk said. Take capital by Marx. The, he said that science is one of the production forces, and both politicians and economists agreed with that. Now, the big question is, is science today part of the economy? The answer from the vast majority would be no. So we need to turn that situation around. We need to make science the driving force of the economy. Now, here's a basic indicator. How do you measure it? Yes or no? Now, here's the measure. What share of the funding that the government combined puts into science, what share is comes from the market, what share comes from the budget. And the situation is drastically different from what we see in other countries. Take Russia. 1.2% of GDP going to R&D. We always want more compared, we say it's peanuts compared with South Korea where they have 4% compared with uh, the US or Israel, Germany. But what share comes from the budget? What share comes from the market? We have 30% to 70%, 7% from the budget and 30 from the market. So the government gives quite a big amount, uh, puts uh, quite a big amount into uh, R&D, so 1.12. But actually, actually, 0.74% that's the uh, how much our, the budget gives. In Japan, 3.14%. So we give 0.74, and in Japan, 0.64. That's how much we give back. So the situation in other countries is roughly the same. So we shouldn't rebuke our government for giving uh, low amounts of funding. No, we need to increase that. We agree that's broad consensus. But the government gives as much as others, and in some cases even bigger, even more. So we need to turn that around 70 to 30. So we need to stimulate our agriculture, our economy, our production to invest not just into innovations which are sort of uh, short-term, like take a pipe instead of uh, a uh, instead of 10-inch uh, pipe, uh, they would like to get uh, a 12-inch uh, pipe. So it's better just a short-term investment. We need our enterprises to invest longer term. We would like them to invest into uh, fundamental research. And that's what's happening in other countries. And this is why the strategy says, OK, we need to get to the 50-50 ratio as soon as possible. And this would be the key indicator that would measure that uh, the economy is engaged in science and the way to measure that, the si that science is also contributes a lot to the economy. We are part of the market economy. We cannot force companies. So we cannot even force uh, Rosatom you know, to invest uh, a lot uh, 
because they are part of the market. They need to think of the payback period, they need to think of the return investments and other measures. So we need to have uh, a, some measures that would stimulate such investments. And uh, there's nothing bad about it. It's a very important role by, on behalf of the government to stimulate. There could be other ways. I'll give an example. One of the ways uh, to incentivize uh, is to set up research and education centers. It's not really about science and innovation. Uh, it's a triangle. There's economy uh, as uh, the top apex uh, of this uh, triangle. Alexander? I'm sorry, you gave uh, Mikhail two minutes. I just need a few words, a few, few more words. And there, uh, through the uh, investment of industries, the whole process uh, will start unwinding. And the government, on their part, and Mikhail Mikhailovich, uh, with our help, because the Academy of Sciences uh, is strongly represented in national projects. So we, together, uh, should make sure uh, that uh, people should be trained, projects uh, should be prepared. This is one of the ways uh, to incentivize our uh, industry. The second uh, is uh, the law about valleys, the valley law. You know uh, that the valley law uh, was um, enacted uh, a year ago, and if uh, the industry or the agriculture comes into these funds uh, with research institutions and other organizations, uh, with the land ownership rights being passed and other means of production, so these investors actually get uh, all the benefits that uh, Skolkova has, for instance. It's also an incentive. So colleagues, I believe that uh, the main objective that uh, faces uh, uh, science interacting with the industry is uh, that considering uh, all our historic tradition, all our experience, uh, we uh, should get uh, to this uh, ratio that's typical of all developed uh, countries as soon as possible. Uh, we should change this proportion. Uh, just like 50-50 uh, by the fourth year. So it's only when uh, this uh, ratio becomes the, uh, gets to this level we can say that uh, science is, giving, is making impact on our economy. Well, thank you very much. I have a problem. I want to ask three questions uh, to different participants. Well, perhaps Anatoly Chubais uh, will win outright. So, Anatoly. Look, we've just heard two things, I think two very important points. One is about incentivizing business uh, to invest in science, and the second one is about uh, support uh, for developments and making sure that they're competitive. So, uh, based on your experience, in Ross Nano, and I mean, uh, there are different ways to look at the Nano project, uh, but uh, what is absolutely uncontestable is that you've been able to set up a whole chain or network uh, of new enterprises. Uh, maybe uh, they belong to different industries, but they're based on the same basic management principles. Uh, and based on the same idea uh, of managing nano uh, materials. So you managed to create this whole network. Uh, of course, uh, you uh, were using some government uh, funding, uh, you used the government support, but the main players were technology companies. So do you think it's possible uh, to start similar projects, and uh, as far as I uh, understand, Havel, for instance, uh, they came up uh, as uh, customers uh, for developments uh, once it turned out uh, that uh, the existing technologies didn't work. Is it possible to serialize, to replicate such projects? Do we now have an understanding of, I don't know how to put it, uh, looking from a technology investor side that there would be demand uh, for both entrepreneurial activity and scientific and research activity. That's the first thing. Secondly, 
developments created uh, in our conditions. Well, what's the risk of subsidizing? Subsidizing is basically uh, like a, a cover-up uh, for uh, helping an uh, inefficient business. So is it at all possible uh, to arrive at making uh, products that would be competitive in the world market? Seven minutes, please. Eight, eight. Oh, no, ten. No, nine, nine, nine. He is right. Well, I'll try. I'll try to answer the difficult questions, Alexander, that you're asking. I've been listening attentively uh, to the president of the Academy of Science and uh, Mikhail as well. Uh, I uh, noticed uh, a few important thoughts for myself that I thought I need to respond to. If you take a look at our Ross Nano projects at a high level, at the moment of foundation, we were allocated 130 billion rubles, of which 110 were investment money. Uh, we've heard a lot of critic criticism, including uh, that from our respected scientists who said, oh, look, uh, so much money uh, has been allocated to you uh, rather than uh, to science. But now let's uh, see what happened in real life. These 110 billion allowed, uh, as of today, we don't yet have the statistic for the previous year, to create an industry that uh, produces the 360 billion ruble worth of products. And uh, the uh, process that Anatoly mentioned uh, actually exists. Well, so uh, you're saying uh, that you need to uh, achieve like 90% share uh, of R&D in sales. Uh, we haven't yet achieved that yet, but 9 to 10% is already a reality. Not because uh, we make them do it, uh, just because uh, if uh, a, a sun battery uh, a factory doesn't do it, uh, they will uh, drop out of the market. So with 360 billion ruble uh, sales worth, our factories reinvested into science 30 billion, which means that the 110 uh, billion that the government had invested as a lump sum initially, uh, they've now returned uh, in a replicable investment to business uh, measured at uh, 30 billion rubles a year and more. So basically, instead of just invading the money and forget about that, we actually uh, started a self-replicating process uh, that invests in science uh, to a considerable measure. And as you understand, uh, the order of our business is the order uh, that uh, people who make orders from our business, uh, they clearly understand what uh, they want. You mentioned uh, solar energy. At the start, it was really very simple. Uh, Wechselberg and I uh, just uh, took some Western Swiss uh, technology of a thin film panel uh, with 9% uh, efficiency and replicate them here. But at the same time, we invested some of the money in the St. Petersburg Physics and Technology Institute, uh, which uh, uh, ended up developing their own solar panel, uh, which uh, we put into production uh, with the efficiency of 72%, uh, which has now become a source of income not only within Russia, but also uh, as an imported, uh, exported item. Uh, so, uh, from the other perspective of what you're asking, uh, do we need to replicate and multiplicate this story? Look, in this sense, uh, these 110 billion that we uh, received uh, have already been invested uh, completely. Of course, we made a lot of mistakes uh, on the way, learned something, and as a result, we don't only have these uh, 360 billion of sales. By the way, uh, with the tax contributions uh, into the national budget resulting from them. But we got one other thing. The money uh, that returned uh, back into the company uh, closed the first investment cycle. We're now at the entry point to the second investment cycle, which uh, actually can uh, be uh, performed without government support. So, so we built 95 uh, factories in uh, 10 years. Uh, in uh, 10 years to come, uh, our uh, heirs uh, will uh, build another uh, 95 plant. So this uh, is actually a self-replicating uh, uh, machine, self-expanding uh, machine uh, that we uh, built. We understand, we've proved through this cycle that the risks uh, that you're talking about and uh, they're typical of any innovation activity. And 
people have stumbled upon them uh, many, many times in the past. So, but they uh, get uh, softened, mitigated uh, through this mechanism. We break into the market. Uh, we break into uh, the regulation hurdles. Uh, we actually uh, find solutions to all problems, including gangsters, because we live in real life. So this way, uh, we allow business, uh, together with us, uh, to create uh, business. By the way, which we leave. We're not strategists. We've. Uh, like uh, take the Kimi uh, factory. We helped build it, and then uh, we withdrew last year. Uh, we are prepared uh, to repeat and repeat and repeat this cycle. And the last thought. Uh, so I wanted to say about the same as uh, the previous speaker. Digitization is, of course, a uh, paramountly important technology trend. It changes our lives. Uh, we all use gadgets like this. And uh, thanks God, thank God it's great. But uh, we tend to uh, rush from one extreme to the other. So everything digital, and we forget about everything else. Digital uh, doesn't exist uh, without material media. So where is this digit? I can't see digital. In order uh, to use digital technologies, uh, you need electronics. Uh, you need communications. You need these devices and gadgets. These are all materials. Hey, guys, it's not just air. Uh, digi digital information can't exist without material media. Uh, so uh, you mentioned what the idea, national hardware. It's a good name. I don't know if national hardware is a good name uh, for a company. But in essence, the idea that you need material media uh, for digital information, and it must be produced here in Russia, this is a paramountly important. So let's not uh, throw out uh, the idea of industry out of uh, this whole discussion. Export products. Export products. You have two more minutes. Ah, export products. OK, three minutes then. Uh, to talk about export products. Look, I was boasting uh, that uh, we have been able uh, to uh, learn uh, to uh, make a real product uh, to the value of 360 billion rubles. But if you think about it, that every factory uh, produces something that hadn't been produced in Russia. For instance, I'm talking about the electronic components. In Russia, uh, there had been no uh, electronic uh, c component uh, production uh, with the uh, less than 100 nanometer uh, design scale. So now we have them. In Russia, we hadn't had any production of optical fiber. So 100%. Now there's a factory in uh, Saransk uh, that we built uh, uh, to produce optical fiber. And I can continue this list, not to boast, just to say uh, that all this that I've mentioned, all these products are not products uh, that have broken through to the uh, world market. It's just a replication of Western technology. But it's only now uh, that uh, we are facing the next step. Had we, uh, you know, tried to do it initially, uh, we wouldn't have been able to cope. But now we already can say which of the products that we can produce uh, can be demanded uh, in the world market uh, today and tomorrow. An example from what now, now that you've mentioned Solsovo, uh, uh, this new solar panel, by the way, uh, it has been uh, certified uh, for 22.7 percent efficiency, top three worldwide. Last year, won an export contract to supply Russian solar uh, uh, panels uh, to the world market. One in the top three of the best panels worldwide. And by the way, the share of export in our 360 billion, uh, we are about uh, twice as high as uh, the processing industry. Just like uh, in uh, the demand for R&D, uh, we're two or three times higher than uh, on average in the industry. So we believe that the Russian nano industry uh, has arrived at a level of four to five billion a year. Uh, it's a number three industries other than oil and gas uh, that to produce uh, such export early. Uh, armaments are, uh, weapons are number one, IT number two. Uh, 
Agriculture, by the way, yeah, agriculture are quite high. But I am not talking uh, about, uh, I'm talking about high tech export. So we are uh, ranking fourth somewhere. So what do we see looking forward? We see two large technology clusters uh, that uh, each, you know, are worth about 10 years of work. So in my understanding, uh, in two or three years' time, uh, they will bring us to the world market with products better uh, than the world market knows. Uh, one of these clusters is called Flexible Electronics. We've worked for 10 years on that, and we're now completing uh, the uh, construction of a Russian Flexible Electronics uh, Center uh, near Moscow. And I'm sure that it's a question of uh, two to three years now to become one of the leaders in the, in the world market. This is one area. And the second area is a classic for us. Uh, it's uh, uh, carbon nano uh, pipes. The product that we started with, where the whole in the whole world the production was two or three tons with uh, exorbitant prices. Uh, now we uh, produce 65 tons at a price which is 70% uh, lower. And we believe that uh, uh, Russia is quite cap capable of uh, launching a world-class uh, cluster in this area, plus a minute, uh, for an exciting conversation. Well, I don't want to reserve the time. Well, you're done. Okay, Sergei. Uh, may, may, uh, may I ask a question of you? Look, look at the example. This is an example how uh, some dedicated activity allows uh, to achieve a planned result. So a whole set of solutions uh, from investment level to uh, regulations and HR result in uh, quite impressive things, right? Why, well, it, or better to say, is, is it possible? Is it possible at all uh, to uh, translate it from out-of-the-box activity uh, to systemic activity? Do we have like an understanding, a framework, a program, a national project where uh, we could uh, take such, ramp up such activity uh, across the board? Exactly uh, in the vein uh, that uh, Mr. Chubais has uh, now explained. Thank you very much uh, for uh, this question. Actually, it's a multifaceted and a sophisticated question depending on many aspects uh, and facts. But let me start from something else. I'd rather start with problems uh, that restrict us uh, from developing faster. Because when we're uh, referring to different countries, different examples, we're talking about specific cases. Uh, the main restrictive factor for us is two-sided, just like a coin, face side and flip side. Firstly, we need to ask a question of whether we have a market for new technologies in Russia. It's obvious that it exists. The question is about its size and how it develops. So, therefore, uh, a task arises. Uh, to stimulate or incentivize the demand uh, for new developments, new technologies, for R&D. Perhaps uh, this is the biggest problems uh, that uh, we are facing in the domestic market. On the other hand, we shouldn't forget uh, that quite naturally, uh, this, uh, these products and stemming from such developments should be competitive worldwide. Uh, so uh, there's a question. Uh, there's a question of about the Russian domestic market being uh, sufficient uh, to fund these technologies. So if we just focus on our domestic needs, uh, we are going to be limited. So therefore, as mentioned before, we always need uh, to uh, aim uh, at reaching out to the worldwide market, because otherwise we'll keep being restricted. There's another side to this, the demand, uh, the supply, I'm sorry, side. So we have a uh, dual situation because uh, we are lacking development on the both sides, uh, both the development, uh, both supply and demand. And uh, therefore, we need uh, to create uh, such tools uh, that uh, could align uh, 
uh, activities uh, focusing at uh, unified strategic goals. And so these uh, research and uh, education uh, clusters that you mentioned, uh, or centers, uh, is uh, one of the ways to do it. Another question about incentivizing major enterprises. Uh, Rosnano, for instance, is a company that uh, was specifically founded uh, to generate new technologies, right? If we talk about Sberbank, uh, it's a company uh, that develops a lot of technologies, not only in banking, it decided to go broader, and it's a good example. So for us, it's very important uh, that most of Russian flagship companies and organizations should go into this direction so that there uh, should be uh, internal incentives external incentives uh, to develop uh, and bring to market new uh, technologies. So now you said how it can be replicated. Well, perhaps uh, not only Rosnano uh, could serve as an example, but other companies as well. Rosatom has been mentioned today because these companies are leaders and they work actively. What's important for us is that we shouldn't have five, six, or seven such leaders, but that most of large companies should become such leaders. And that uh, will uh, bring about the demand. Another uh, fundamental thing that I'd like to mention, of course, uh, we need to uh, take a very close look at markets. When we're looking at markets, because I don't only do innovations, I, only, I also, uh, I'm also responsible uh, for the oriental uh, area uh, of our activity. Uh, what I can say is that uh, we just don't see some markets. Why? I don't know why we don't see uh, Asian Pacific market. Maybe uh, they're too far away. Because there are a lot of Russian technologies uh, that could v uh, very well be placed uh, in, let's say, Asia-Pacific Asia market. It would be diff more difficult in the European market because there are different uh, situations here, including geopolitical, uh, that uh, restrain us to a certain extent. But talking about actively developing markets, uh, Southeast market, uh, Asia-Pacific market, is very good for us to find use for our technologies. On the other hand, we need to stimulate our internal demand, uh, develop, uh, uh, supply, uh, combining business, uh, research, and academia, uh, because business has always been like a battering ram uh, for... Uh, by the way, I've taken a look uh, of, uh, at patent statist statistics. Uh, we've got statistic for uh, Chinese patents uh, in uh, the U.S., where China uh, ranked uh, first, and then I took a look at our applications. We're growing, uh, but this is our compensational growth. We only have uh, 3 to 5 percent growth. In actual fact, if you uh, take a look at the growth curve in China in patent numbers, it's like 20, 30 percent. So i just conferring, uh, confirming that we don't even have enough products uh, to offer. So locally they exist, but on the whole it's not enough. And of course, uh, it's very important uh, to talk about changes in regulations, because uh, regulations are a matter of principle for us. It's just like about the sandbox idea. It's very important. Uh, new technologies, uh, whatever they are, require uh, being able uh, to place them uh, in uh, the country's te territory, maybe not in the entire country, because it uh, uh, is a, entails risks. So we need sandboxes. Uh, it's an important tool uh, to make sure that new technologies become uh, demanded, uh, in demand in our market. And in conclusion, one example. I recently met, you know, we have a national champions uh, project uh, covering about 60 companies. These are companies that started five to six years ago as small startups. They've now reached a mid-size uh, level. All of them are high tech, 50% from IT, uh, other 50% from other industries, from chemistry to biology, all the way to agriculture. Uh, selectively. So I can tell you the biggest uh, problem uh, that they're mentioning. So my first expectation uh, would be uh, to hear complaints about not enough funds being available to them. But their biggest problems, according to them, is that they say, we have money, uh, we're, invest uh, we're ready to invest. The biggest question is about demand. They said the question of demand is the key one for us, not only fundamentally the country, but also outside, abroad. And uh, so I just like to confirm that if we're talking about the traditional economy, 
how much we can grow uh, per year in a traditional economy, two to three uh, percent maybe at max. So in order uh, to go beyond that, you need to make a specific focus on modern technologies. And here I agree uh, with my colleague uh, that focus is very important, priorities are very important, because we won't be able, uh, uh, us and you, uh, to develop all the strategic uh, areas in technology. We need uh, to determine uh, which areas uh, may uh, bring Russia to the leadership position. Nanopipes, okay, Na oh, nanotubes, okay, we, we need to focus on that. And we need to allocate funds. Uh, both for basic science and R&D and uh, uh, implementation in real products. Thank you. Good. At least three areas. We need a very good alignment between the uh, programs of the two ministries. So otherwise it would be impossible for them to exist uh, without each other. And it's also a mystery to me. Could you share so, shed some light on that? I don't really understand. How do we stimulate entrepreneurs? You know, stimulating entrepreneurs has nothing to do with the spirit of entrepreneurship. If you do have a solution, I'd be happy to listen. And we are in a kind of a rut. We are sort of a, uh, we, we cannot go beyond the convention, conventions. Good. We all understand very well how the economy of the country is structured. What we know the role of the state. It's a overwhelming. We would like all state corporations to be as good as Rosatom, Russian Atomic Power Agency. But it's not always possible. I'd like you to focus on two areas. From what I remember, 2018 was the year of science for Rosatom. What did it mean for you? What was the impact, both for Rosatom and for the uh, communities? And my second question, we have several major projects, mega projects as they are known, and one of them is the Arctic exploration, and Rosatom is the infrastructure operator, if I'm not mistaken, for the northern sea route. You have to tackle many technological challenges. How do you address those issues? Will it play the same role as the atomic project played in its days and age? Thank you so much for these questions. Well, I will not be able to reply to all of these questions in uh, even 20 minutes, but I'll try to do it in broad strokes. Historically, R&D and applied science in the nuclear energy has always coexisted. In this century, this century, production was the key focus, state cooperation was set up, and science was transferred to the Kurchatov, Kurchatov Institute. And it's hard to do a hard line between us. But Rosatom is more about production. There's another example of the founding fathers who set a very high benchmarks in terms of implementing uh, technology and discoveries, a transforming them into production solutions. 1938, fission was discovered, then 43, the first. Uh, 
controlled reactions, uh, 45, we have uh, uh, the first uh, nuclear bombs in 1959, the first uh, nuclear-powered icebreak. History had, had never known such a pace of uh, transforming scientific discoveries into production. And it's hard to, to share, it's hard to identify what is the share of uh, which industry. Well, we do remember that Beria, the man behind uh, the Stalin's purges, was at the head of this industry. But if you look at the US, the pace was the same. Now, going back to your question on the year of science, our founding fathers, including Kurchatov, whose name has been bestowed on the Kurchatov Institute, have uh, given us quite a great margin in terms of new discoveries. And in turn, we've now been able to move from a monopoly into a national leader. We are a leader in the nuclear atomic power industry. We are unique because we employ all the atomic technologies. But we also understand that we don't have enough technology, latest cutting-edge technology, to support our leading role going forward. This is why we announced the Sierra of Science, and I agree that talents lie at the core of everything. They are the biggest assets. We also need to bring in new people, younger people, to the level of managers. We also need to raise the uh, status of the profession. It needs to be looked at as a prestigious profession. We need to increase the salaries. We need to take decisions, and these decisions had been taken. Right now, it's prestigious to be, it's fashionable to be part of the scientific community. Another area, another point that I'd like to make is when you define the milestones, the deadlines that, uh, in terms of research, that the industry is ready to provide financing for. So it's hard for me to sit in between the ministries and between the scientific community. Well, I believe the responsibility lies with the science. Not all of the heads of the Scientific institutions were ready to talk to us. Some continue to operate. You know, we are always careful about with our talents, but we realize that some of the directors of our institutions had to had to leave. They became research uh, advisors or vice presidents for research, but not the CEOs of uh, in our institutions. Without resolving these issues, we will not be able to maintain our leadership in this industry. There's another area that you mentioned, the Northern Sea Route. We have expanded our agenda in the past year, the past years. We have stopped being just an atomic power company. We have now expanded into other areas where we do have some competencies. Take the digital. After a ban on nuclear tests, we had to do a lot of uh, modeling, mathematical modeling, and that's some of the muscles that we do have. And we're also dealt with uh, nuclear waste. So it could be part of a uh, 
national environmental protection uh, project. So we have a lot of uh, expertise in those areas. And another area is cooperation, collaboration with the Kurchatov Institute, with the Academy of Sciences, with universities, including under the umbrella of uh, the MIFI Institute. Uh, it has a lot of branches. So the year of science for us, in a nutshell, was an opportunity to boost the prestige of our stuff. We've identified our priorities and identified the sources of financing and collaboration. I um, really much appreciate uh, the efforts by Mikhail Kavalchuk and uh, Alexander Sergeyev. They've been always put a lot of demands on us, but we would like to have a, a balanced relationship. We need to, to meet each other halfway and help out each other. And thanks to the achievements uh, and discoveries made by the Kurchatov Institute and also some of the research institutions of the Russian Academy of Sciences. We will definitely try to strengthen and maintain our leadership in this industry. As for the new areas, the Northern Sea Route, yes. It act, we actually rely here on the icebreaker fleet. Uh, we have transformed it from a loss-making into a profit-making uh, and uh, very, that is very appealing for investors. And we will continue to invest into it. So this, this task is very simple. The President said we need to, to transport uh, up to 80 million tons via the Northern Sea Route uh, by 2024, and also take uh, LNG. We will only be able to compete uh, in the LNG market if we are able to transport uh, our LNG from the Arctic to other territories around the world very quickly. If we are able to do it, then we are part of the LNG market. So the Yamal project is very important. So we'll definitely fine-tune our own technology in terms of uh, nuclear-powered uh, engines. And we'll also help adjacent technologies like the digital technology, construction companies, uh, design companies. We also need to do a lot of forecasting. Uh, forecasting of the ice cover, you know, there are some, some say the ice cover is uh, going up, some say the, uh, it's thinning out, but we need to have until it 2050, until 2035 to understand what is the patterns, because each new project has its own specifics. Uh, we need to be able to forecast the ice cover very accurately. The Northern Sea Route is not just a, the Russian project. It's a global project. So together with uh, the with Ronepa, we started to predict what would be the trade turnover for this project, and we need to justify our figures. We need to move the trade flow, cargo flow, all the traffic from the Indian Ocean to the Arctic Ocean. This is an arduous task, and if we are able to do it, then we will be build more and more icebreakers. I don't think I've replied to all of your questions. I doubt that. Well, I'm sure I have more questions. And I, you know, I've got a lot to tell you. I know. Thank you. Mr. Kuznetsov, the same question, but you can adjust it uh, to your industry. So you are one of the leaders uh, in the digital economy. Sparebank becomes one of the leaders. High-tech companies, in terms of the software, at least. What's your assessment? I'm trying to uh, do it because uh, your operations depend on it. 
So are you driven by the market trends, are driven by some simple, obvious things, or is it an investment project that could bring about global transformation and increasing the productivity in other areas too? Thank you. It's an excellent question. In brief, you're right. So far, the digital economy is based on this kind of uh, uh, ideas, and it's pretty sad. We uh, understand that uh, we only do it in some of the areas, uh, we only do some of the project because we have to do it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to move forward as a banking institution. We see a deficit in a single architecture on all of these six areas, particularly when all these six areas don't have a single architecture. We also need to have at least two or three priorities for the country, for the entire economy, for industries, and also in terms of the technology, in terms of the platforms. So there are basically more questions than answers. We need to work together with the government. But it's one of the major priorities that we are facing today in order to enhance the role of the digital economy, or the share of the digital economy. Just two points that I'd like to make. I'd like to support the approach by Mr. Sergeyev, uh, the president of the Russian Academy of Sciences. When we talked about the role of the fundamental science in Russia today and collaboration with the business community. In terms of systemic approaches, we don't have much to brag about. We did have one project, the Russian Academy of Sciences and Sberbank's project was awarded by the government. It was a project in cybersecurity. We delivered a new IT system for banks. It's a new generation solution. We introduced it. it it's one of the positive project, but it's one of the few, one of the only ones. And under the circumstances, we have to create our own IT centers. We have nine excellence centers, we call them laboratories, and we do high-tech research in nine areas, including AI, robotics, and other areas like cybersecurity. What I feel is that today we just follow the trends. We can't really boast that we define or shape those tech trends. Now, what are the trends going forward in the next two or three years. By 2022, we'll have cars that are fully 3D printed. By 2023, 10% of all glasses would be con connected uh, devices. Then we will see people with avatars uh, in the digital world. The first taxes would be would be uh, collected using blockchain technology by 22 by 2022. By 2025, a third of audit inspections would be done by AI. By the same year, some share of cars in the U.S. will be driverless. In 2022, there will be at least one robot uh, as part of uh, the board of directors that will have to take decisions. And soon we will see cities without traffic lights, uh, and a the AI will help cars, will navigate them. 
And also, someday in the future, blockchain technology will help to uh, to uh, um, maintain uh, the GDP. But very often, we are not the country that initiated those projects. We will. We are not the company that uh, brought about that or this technology. In terms of the digital economy generally, here's my concern. Applied areas in the digital economy are well known. But what about the fundamental science in the digital economy? On the one hand, we are not interested in fundamental research. We heard statements like this, but I disagree with this. I believe that major companies are also interested in fundamental research. Why? Because customers are the focus of our attention. We need to identify customers, we need to provide safe, secure products for our customers. So we would like to introduce, we would like to have a, make a breakthrough in quantum, uh, quantum uh, coding in, and new biometrics solutions, uh, saliva, no tears. In, not the ones that exist today, unconventional biometric solutions. So you, these are usually not the top tier research areas, uh, but uh, that's where we'd like to be. And you know what concerns me a lot? It would seem that this uh, digital economy program is quite new uh, and good, but the methods that we're using, implementing the first steps, uh, for some reason are quite traditional, conventional. We're forgetting uh, the role of science. So I'll allow myself uh, some criticism. So one of the areas that uh, has been implemented uh, already and not in the good way. It's about the research that was done as part of the digital economy program uh, called uh, uh, comprehensive analysis of information security risks. Uh, there was a contest. Uh, it lasted one week uh, with the participation of all sorts of uh, scientists, companies, organizations, including Moscow State University. And it wasn't science who won. Uh, a small company won. I'm not going to mention its name. It's about something completely different. It's about supplying hardware. And uh, two options. Either uh, they uh, created a bad product, uh, which is basically what happened, or uh, they just served uh, as intermediaries. And this is a traditional, uh, traditional situation uh, that uh, happens over and over again. We plan uh, to spend a lot of money from the national budget and get something like that as a result. Okay, time is up. Yeah, uh, and the second um, comment I wanted to make, it's uh, actually a request to Alexander Mikhailovich. Uh, about the quality of education that we're getting today. Uh, let me cite an example. Sberbank. Uh, Sb uh, we're working uh, on a very uh, narrow, uh, focused area uh, in Moscow, cybersecurity. 20 to 20 percent of the market uh, experience, there's a sh shortage of 20 to 20 percent uh, uh, in the labor market. Uh, so formally, uh, we churn out 18,000 specialists in this area a year, and the reporting is excellent. But frankly, the quality of uh, such a specialist uh, is below uh, any uh, satisfaction uh, for us. Uh, we now uh, have... Uh, uh, we have uh, to uh, create a corporate education system to retrain uh, people uh, according to our needs. And it's a big problem. And I hope very much uh, that as part of the digital economy pro uh, uh, program, and uh, it has a separate section about education, so we'll be able uh, to change this approach, uh, not uh, spending government money on something that uh, is off focus. Okay, no. Not a lot of joy stems uh, from uh, your presentation, but on the other hand, uh, there must be a balance somewhere. Uh, so, so it's uh, very close to uh, this subject. Uh, 
uh, that uh, would be close to the heart of Vladimir Vasiliev. Litmo, St. Petersburg National Research, IT University, uh, I believe is one of the few universities uh, that we can call entrepreneurial, uh, like a self-sustained entity. I'm sure uh, you'll be able to uh, ask, uh, answer, reply uh, to the previous speaker. So can universities, as part of the system in a country, become such economic agents around which a fast developing you know, business belts uh, could uh, emerge uh, through the fast translation of knowledge uh, into energy intensive environment? Young people uh, that don't yet have a lot to lose, uh, that are not, uh, you know, burdened by all sorts of, you know, life circumstances. So, Vladimir, five minutes. Well, I could have uh, talked about security, actually, uh, but the main question uh, was about the universities. Well, in actual fact, you have to understand, you have to define university. Uh, if uh, you're talking about a university, you have uh, 206 or 480 universities in Russia. I, I'm not going to talk about these universities. I'm about those universities uh, that uh, perform uh, the learning process uh, based uh, on uh, scientific research. That's as a mandatory component. And the third mission is involvement uh, in uh, inno innovation, uh, entrepreneurial that's being able to have all those competencies. But uh, let me stress research once again. And again, I'd like to come back to the start of the discussion uh, because uh, Mikhail Kovalchuk uh, started uh, with the uh, scientific development strategy, uh, which was then supported uh, by the question of focus, and it's about global challenges that we're facing, uh, so it addresses other problems. So I'm not uh, really talking about a university as an, uh, in its uh, uh, educational uh, research and entrepreneurial uh, facets, but I'm talking about a university uh, that's capable of taking on huge global challenges, and it's another level of universities. So when it's about such challenges, uh, whether you want it or not, you have to talk about interdisciplinarity. Uh, Vladimir Valentinovich uh, uh, talked some time ago about uh, technologies uh, that uh, get uh, injected into one another. I'm talking about convergent technologies. Uh, but uh, the same thing can be said about interdisciplinarity, because any large challenge or global challenge is about interdisciplinarity. Uh, not multidisciplinarity, but interdisciplinarity. So the solution, where sol a solution uh, can be only proposed uh, by converging to different disciplines. Uh, another element is very important. You have to understand that a university uh, that uh, can uh, take on global challenges uh, can't be isolated. Uh, it would be wrong. It would collapse, for sure. Uh, the university uh, should operate as an open system in absolutely different areas. The first one uh, is in time. So it should start from school. The university should go back in time to school starting uh, working to work with children. I am not going to claim that they should go to the kindergarten, but high school, that's certainly the place. Uh, the university uh, should go outside uh, in terms of organization. It should get in touch uh, with or reach out to the Academy of Sciences, business. If uh, they have this entrepreneurial uh, element, uh, they uh, will have to go to Mr. Chubais, to different investment funds, uh, and get new competences there as well. The key word is openness. It should go to other, reach out to other universities, because there's no 
no university in the world that has all competences uh, to uh, tackle large-scale uh, challenges. So, uh, therefore, networking is very important. So this openness, actually, two speakers mentioned, world-class research and educational center. So this center is not an organization, but the first word here is an association. Association. Uh, world class working uh, to solve global challenges. And uh, there we arrive at the third element of such a new type of university. It doesn't have national borders. It goes beyond borders, just like science has no national borders. And from there, uh, we derive mobility of scientists, researchers, mobility of the faculty, mobility of the students, again, to address global challenges. And you shouldn't be afraid of that. Today, in one of the sessions, they already mentioned a drain brain, brain drain. So, hey guys, there's no brain drain, there's mobility. People come here as well. So uh, we get people from Harvard uh, at uh, Litmo. We go to MIT for two or three months uh, to uh, read lectures and come back uh, to solve and address problems. And the next, next approach is project-based approach uh, because uh, to solve problems, you need to organize them into specific projects funded by Sberbank, uh, Rosatom, Life Itself, uh, society. And then, if it's done this way, uh, this interinjection of technologies uh, will happen. So therefore, I conclude, the university is the key element in the chain, but this has been an absolutely different kind of a university. Uh, as to information security, well, frankly, uh, I was even surprised. Uh, we have 206 university uh, churning out uh, IT security specialists. No, no, no. Uh, there are 17,000 graduates. I just mentioned we have 206 specialists uh, who graduated uh, from 206 uh, university out of 400, which means that Ah, you mean to say that they uh, didn't get the speciality as a graduation speciality, acquiring it on work. Well, maybe. Uh, well, this is just another testament uh, to the fact uh, that uh, this approach uh, to gaining uh, skills through mobility uh, has become a norm. Uh, we are talking about top universities when it comes to global uh, challenges. I'm not uh, going... Well, there are other uh, learning organizations. Uh, they don't go this way. Uh, they uh, train uh, operations people. Do we need such people? Yes, we do. Uh, they just... Okay. I'm sorry. At this time, it's time. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Sergey. Mr. Polikov, a simple question to you. Uh, at the background of uh, questions that we've already addressed, so we have different ways of translation of knowledge uh, from development uh, to economics. Uh, one of the uh, challenge or channels uh, involves uh, startups. The fund has existed for 25 years now. Imagine that. So where are all these startups? Sergey, it's a provocative question, of course. Well, actually, they do exist, and there are lots of them. And by the way, we have 23 uh, projects uh, in uh, Rosnano uh, out of the first investment cycle uh, involving 80 uh, projects. And you're right, on the other hand, uh, that the commercial uh, commercialization uh, mechanisms are, well, there are lots of them. And uh, this uh, startup uh, mechanism, I believe, is quite important. All the more so uh, that uh, virtually every uh, in the innovation-based economy uh, or in information uh, e economy uh, countries uh, have, have been driven uh, by innovation companies. So uh, even though we 
Uh, well, I think the, uh, the question about uh, the, an increase in the share of innovation-based companies in uh, GDP uh, is very important, and it aligns uh, with the program uh, that the President uh, has uh, put forward. Uh, so, of course, uh, we should address it by uh, making uh, the startup funnel broader. Uh, so uh, the way to do it uh, is uh, to drive uh, the uh, popularization uh, of information about uh, such opportunities. I believe we should start uh, with a school, and actually we work with schools, and the potential I believe uh, is uh, quite uh, uh, impressive. Uh, we've got uh, like 30,000 applications uh, for the nationwide uh, competition. And you know, school children do all sorts of projects, including launching satellites to orbit. And so it's, uh, on the other hand, it's quite natural because who other than young people uh, should be the drivers of the startup economy? Uh, what, uh, what's also important, extremely important, uh, to uh, increase uh, the role of innovative companies in the national economy of Russia is it's about the access uh, to orders of large corporations. And, uh, and the market, of course, is uh, huge. Of course, uh, there's consumer market, but it's uh, quite difficult uh, for uh, startups to compete uh, with foreign corporations. So it's difficult to get uh, to the consumer market. But as to the purchasing market, uh, the chances for startups are much higher. I can cite an example from Airbus. Uh, they now use about 5,000 small companies who are their suppliers. If you take a look at the Russian uh, United Aircraft Corporation, the situation is quite the opposite. Uh, you'd have fingers in both of your hands uh, enough uh, to count all such uh, suppliers. Uh, so I think this is the area where we should focus, uh, get young people involved, including children, you know, students, postgraduate students, and of course access uh, to enterprise orders. Uh, that would be another thing. Thank you very much. Colleagues, from uh, what has been said today, I got an impression that uh, there's a whole a lot of uh, contradictions and restrictions uh, that uh, are intrinsic uh, to this communication and interaction system. It's mostly in our heads, so what Sergey mentioned about new markets. Uh, but isn't it strange that people who want to develop don't look uh, where, uh, at the sources of the biggest growth? And again, uh, back uh, to the incentive of incentivization of entrepreneurs. Once again, if they need incentives, uh, they're not entrepreneurs. You are somebody different if you don't move forward uh, without uh, outside help. Uh, a considerable gap between planning horizons to risk and invest for 10 years to come in order uh, to get the yield and actually uh, build a machine that would churn out you know, revenue every year. Even in the same term of uh, research order. Or to just allocate uh, funds for the current projects. Either or. So these things, I don't believe uh, it's very easy uh, to remove these questions, even if you've achieved some agreements or made some decisions. Uh, again, this whole experience of this fresh digital economy project uh, program, it was adopted uh, by you know adequate people, by ourselves. Actually, uh, not somebody else. There are no, there's nobody else. And already we have we see some systemic constraints there that require us to rethink how this work should be done. Alexander, I would ask you uh, to offer an assessment from a different perspective, not uh, just uh, researchers, technologists, but from the socio-cultural perspective. Well, thank you. Dear friends, uh, five minutes. I am sorry, five minutes. I understand. Well, there are a lot of people in this room, I think, uh, who sit here and think uh, it's some nonsense. So. 
uh, what people do themselves in the leading countries of the world. Here we have uh, to uh, set up some development institutions, allocate some uh, money from the national budgets. Why is it so happening? Let's be frank. Ten years ago, what was our understanding uh, ten years ago? So, you know, set up national uh, environment and then it will work out uh, on its own. Why did it do it this way? Because it turned out to be quite a different uh, thing. Because it turned out that institutions are different. Uh, that's back to the question of who is set up to do what. There are institutions that are inclus inclusive, that work as a magnet, and there are institutions that are extractive, uh, that uh, just get the rent. We have great institutions uh, for uh, capturing the rent. Monopoly organizations, administrative organizations, and uh, so what we see is that there are more subjects who are just uh, uh, cutting the budget uh, into pieces. And uh, we can't fix it in two, three, or five years, because apart from everything else, uh, it all has to do with the invisible part of the iceberg, with the cultural uh, standards uh, that are aligned with these institutions. And I believe that we just need uh, to recognize that in these conditions uh, we'll be uh, moving slowly and uh, development will, rather, will be rather an exception than a rule. Uh, we have to strive at building a, a situation uh, where uh, no government money uh, will need to be spent. Why? Because uh, Increasing uh, the size of funding will not give us results unless uh, we see uh, what kind of engine uh, we're pouring this fuel into. And there are quite a lot of examples like that. So conclusion one, we are not uh, going uh, for frontal uh, modernization. We're going to look uh, for breakthrough points and we'll be uh, running manually govern, governed uh, projects with government support and uh, going this way until uh, we manage uh, to uh, start these self uh, sustaining mechanism. Now, uh, who to uh, prepare? Uh, I guess uh, the situation with education is even worse than that. Uh, at the economics uh, department of MSU, uh, we already started some projects, not only with other departments, uh, but also with Litmo and Peter the Great Polytechnic University in St. Petersburg. But look, there was an expression that education, the process of, uh, you know, uh, the uh, system fighting, uh, of the system of human intelligence fighting uh, the natural uh, conditions. So I can tell you that we've already won. Uh, that, uh, of course, uh, MSU uh, is uh, one of the top 100, and there are several universities in the second 100. But on average, uh, in higher education, we're at the level of South Korea, France, and Spain, which is quite low. Uh, look, we'll have to rebuild the system. So the system that we built in the 90s uh, yielded a bad result. And I'll tell you what we'll need to fix. Where do we have motives uh, for innovation? Rosatom has a moment. It's a worldwide uh, nuclear industry leader, 26% as of 2016, I didn't know, 2017 numbers. Uh, so this is a major uh, market share. Kaspersky, Mail.ru, Roscosmos. We have like three dozen or so companies uh, that emerged uh, from our national environment and that operate worldwide. We have uh, about two dozen such universities. We have primary school uh, where our people are still quite good good worldwide. So connect these points. Uh, try to connect these points. And uh, the second layer where you need uh, to uh, look, uh, look for solutions. We're a very diverse country. It's a great good. Uh, I tell you, we've just finished research. Uh, the general director, uh, the CEO, uh, and RVK, the CEO doesn't know yet, and it's an IAC, RVK uh, project. But I know. Uh, 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 individualism, uh, self-sustained uh, preparedness for innovation that grows in this country from west uh, to east. Uh, there are good indicators in Yakutia that hasn't yet started any serious innovation projects. Other indicators 
And, uh, we, we, we have uh, other indicators in different uh, areas. And in, as a general fact, people are better than institutions in Russia. So uh, it's a common belief uh, that in this country people don't want uh, their children to become an entrepreneur. Uh, they prefer them uh, to become a government official to get bribes. But our research gave different results. So if you ask, uh, uh, what do you think yourself? Uh, they uh, are all for entrepreneurship. But when you ask, uh, what does the majority of population think? What do you think? And then uh, they say, both uh, most people are against entrepreneurship. But I think uh, that uh, there are reasons for growth, and we can use them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. Well, I must say that uh, well, when starting this discussion, I thought that the task uh, was uh, quite difficult. And now, uh, the level of uh, empathy that I experience uh, for Nikolai uh, has grown. Nikolai, I would like to ask you a couple of things. Uh, we're over time already. Yeah. I'm not going to. So, two things. It's uh, difficult uh, to achieve new results if uh, the same people uh, take part and the same tools and same resources are used. What are these new tools? Take the uh, world-known research institutes, maybe new collaboration programs. So what new tool? What new tools do you provide to align the market, the academia, and the entrepreneurs? And I would also like you to sum up the uh, key takeaways from this discussion. We don't, we don't have the uh, final solutions, but there are still ideas I think that have emerged that you could take into account so thank you so much for moderating the discussion thank this I'd like to thank the speakers and I'd like to thank the audience it's uh, nice to see such a high turnout so we see the same face as the same panelists, but the ideas that you have come up with uh, sound uh, from a new perspective. We might uh, hear these ideas, but we might not uh, absorb them, then digest that. I, th I feel we have unique opportunities. The priorities have been identified at the top level. We do have a strategy. We know where we should invest our resources. We have identified our funding. We have six-year planning. Again, that's unique for our experience. Number three. We have now almost completed the inventory of the potential that we have. We now have a clear idea of where we are. We have identified our, the tasks for the future. These are ambitious large-scale goals. Our R&D investment should double in the next six years. So if we could do it earlier, it would be even better, but we cannot do it alone. We need to act in a systemic way. We need to, increase, to double the outcome of our research, both publications and patents. We need to do a lot of research for the private and the public sector. And it's not a trivial task. It's a challenge for the universities, and it's a challenge for other companies. I would agree with Sparebank and Rosatom. If the 
commu business community is not part of it, then we would have to retrain the people. And this is why we would like to see joint projects between the academia and the uh, business community. It was nice to see to hear that we do have success. We need to roll out this uh, success, roll out the best practices so it's uh, more available. And we are now completing the single management framework. It would bring together all of the over control over research. We have not had such a solution. Right now, we would have a single national program. It's been discussed. We hope it will be approved uh, very soon. And we need to have a single R&D management uh, system. It would uh, consist of the Russian Academy of Sciences, all of the institutions. We would need to have industrial production companies and development uh, institutions. We need to create one single architecture. National projects, in, in this, the national project envisages uh, the creation of new training centers, world-class uh, excellent centers, a leading research uh, institution as part of the digital economy. And one of the goals is to make it uh, as a one comprehensive framework that would help us to resolve key technological and uh, also uh, personnel issues. We are now finalizing the approval of the necessary rules and regulations. Uh, these programs need to unite all of the cycles and stages from ideas to prototyping to rolling out. And our system needs to support entrepreneurs at every stage. These are competitive technologies that would have a, an impact back home and abroad. And I would agree with uh, one of the previous speakers that would define our role in the global economy. And I would like to disagree that uh, our higher education is bad. No, we do have 47 institutions uh, as part of the global rankings, but uh, it's not they're not part of a uh, top 100, but a couple of years ago, you know, there used to be only a few institutions uh, and global rankings. We would develop that part, but again, it needs to be closely aligned with the industry, with the uh, academia. So network formats, transparent, open formats, that's the way forward. And the most important stage begins right now. Internal transformation. If you want to change the world, change yourself first. Our academia needs to be more open. The Russian Academy of Sciences need to be more transparent. And we do have some guidance that has been passed. And I feel positive that uh, we would like, we would be able to bring it all together. Piece together all the puzzles, pieces, and come to a completely different level. Thank you so much. Thank you, our distinguished panelists. I really appreciate that you have found the time to come here and discuss uh, such challenging uh, issues. It's up to the ministry, but I believe that it would be good to replicate this example so that it's a positive 
experience. Thank you so much and good luck to all of you.